Our next speaker is Ryan Janke from Jasper Rhine's lab, and he's going to be telling us about new connections between oncometabolites and transcriptional silencing. Okay, so I'd like to start by thanking the organizers today for the opportunity to speak. Um, so I'm a postdoc in Jasper Rhine's lab, and in the Rhine lab we study various aspects of gene silencing. And to study gene silencing, we often turn to uh, two loci in budding yeast that you're mostly probably familiar with called HML and HMR. And these are transcriptionally silent domains. And silencing of these domains depends on the SIR complex composed of proteins SIR2, SIR3, and SIR4. And so a couple of other aspects about uh, HML and HMR that I'd like to point out is that we know that the silent state is epigenetically inherited through mitosis. And we also know that the silent state is intimately uh, connected to different um, histone modifications, particularly um, histone methylation and histone acetylation. And so in the silent form, um, these regions are hypoacetylated and hypomethylated on their histones. But we also know that um, silencing, the establishment and the maintenance of silencing uh, is um, influenced by different histone tail modifications, particularly acetylation and methylation. So that uh, makes this a particularly valuable locus um, for studying the regulation of silencing, which is what I'm particularly interested in. And mostly what I'm interested in focusing on is understanding how um, changes in the environment of a cell can actually influence uh, the regulation of silencing. And so, um, Certain changes, particularly uh, that might influence metabolism, um, could convey information to the genome and the epigenome actually through metabolism. Uh, and the connection between metabolism and epigenetic regulation, or at least one of the more obvious connections, is that uh, for every known histone modification, there's a metabolite associated with the enzymatic reaction that either adds or removes the histone mark. And so I'm interested in understanding how changes in the external environment of a cell, particularly through changes in nutrition, or how uh, meta metabolic diseases that um, influence metabolism could impact uh, epigenetic regulation. And so for the rest of the talk, um, we'll be thinking about this in the context of disease. And so one of the most prominent um, metabolic disorders that um, humans are faced with is actually cancer. And, um, and so uh, um, there's been a resurgence of interest in uh, understanding tumor metabolism and uh, things like the Warburg effect and trying to figure out whether changes in tumor metabolism actually um, are important for influencing the progression of tumors. And, um, and so one example of how alterations in tumor uh, metabolism um, has been uh, recently identified has, uh, are mutations in isocitrate dehydrogenase genes. And so these different uh, green triangles that I'm showing here are uh, mutations that have been mapped to NADP-dependent isocitrate dehydrogenases. And these mutations have been found in uh, a growing list of different types of tumors. And in some cases, these mutations uh, are highly prevalent. So for example, in secondary glioblastomas, up to 70% of the tumors um, actually have a mutation in one of their isocitrate dehydrogenase genes. And the other thing I'd like to point out is that these mutations occur at particular residues, so arginine-132 and the analogous arginine-172 in the mitochondrial enzyme. And so what do these mutations do? So typically, isocitrate dehydrogenase converts isocitrate to alpha-ketoglutarate, but in these tumors with these particular mutations, that Ford reaction is abolished. And instead, the mutant enzyme converts alpha-ketoglutarate into uh, a, a metabolite called D2-hydroxyglutarate. So, so we all have D2-hydroxyglutarate in our cells, but typically it's kept at very low levels, but it accumulates to very high levels in these tumors. And uh, there's no, uh, currently there's no f known function for this metabolite, um, but I think it's a matter of time before that's worked out. And so our cells do seem to actively keep D2-hydroxyglutarate levels uh, low, and they do this through an enzyme called D2-hydroxyglutarate dehydrogenase. 
And in the tumors where uh, D2 hydroxyglutarate levels accumulate to high, uh, to high levels, um, the impact of that has been shown to inhibit a, a number of demethylases, so a family of histone demethylases and a family of DNA demethylases. And it's thought that these, the inhibition of these um, demethylases is involved in the progression of these tumors, although the mechanism of how that works is not clearly defined. And also the individual contributions of either hi inhibiting histone demethylases versus the contribution of inhibiting the DNA demethylases is also not very well established. And so I approached uh, this uh, with one very simple question. I wanted to ask whether high levels of D2-hydroxyglutarate could impact transcriptional silencing. And so to study this, I turned to our trusty budding yeast. And I used an assay developed in the Rhine lab by a previous student, Ann Dotson. Uh, we call this the crash assay. And this assay works by inserting Cree recombinase gene uh, at HML. And when you do that, Cree becomes silenced. Oh, sorry. Um, and on another chromosome, we inserted uh, this cassette, including a constitutively um, expressed RFP flanked by two LOX P sites and then a downstream GFP. And so when silencing is maintained, the cells express RFP. However, if there's uh, even a transient loss of silencing, the cells express Cree and uh, switch from expressing RFP to GFP. And this is a permanent inheritable switch. And so the way that we often use this assay is by simply plating cells and letting them grow into colonies. And uh, the way it manifests, we just image the top of the colonies and for RFP and GFP, and it manifests as a mostly RFP expressing colony, but with um, GFP sectors. So at the apex of each one of these GFP sectors, there is a loss of silencing event, and, and that causes the cells and all of its uh, um, preceding cells to express GFP. And so we can essentially um, look at these colonies and um, look at the number of GFP switches that occur, and that's our measure for uh, the stability or the loss of silencing. And so when I use this assay to uh, look at um, analogous mutations to those found in uh, IDH uh, mutant tumors, uh, I saw a decrease in the number of GFP sectors. Uh, and so th what that, the way we interpret that with this assay is that silencing is actually stabilized or increased. And so we can actually quantify the number of um, uh, GFP events in these colonies uh, through a collaboration with Yoon Song's lab at Berkeley. We developed a software that can just um, count the number of GFP events. And you can see here that uh, in the tumor, anal the mutations analogous to those found in tumors, that the level of GFP goes down or silencing is increased. So um, I, the next thing I wanted to ask is if we made other mutations that uh, are proposed to increase D2-hydroxyglutarate levels in the cell, would they have a, a similar phenotype? And it turns out that yeast have a D2-hydroxyglutarate dehydrogenase. In yeast, it's called DLD2. And when I mutated DLD2, uh, I saw the same effect. I saw a decrease in the number of GFP events or an uh, increase in the stability of silencing. And so this is just a, a mass spec measurement of D2-hydroxyglutarate showing that we see a substantial increase in the level of this uh, metabolite in these mutations. Okay, so we know from, so the next thing I want to figure out is what are the relevant targets of accumulating D2-hydroxyglutarate that are causing this effect on silencing. And we know from the cancer literature that uh, accumulation of this metabolite can uh, inhibit these demethylases, and that's where I wanted to start looking. And it's a little bit simpler in yeast because yeast don't have DNA demethylases, so I want to know whether histone demethylation was being inhibited. So the first thing I did was just looked at bulk histone methylation levels, and what I saw was that uh, in mutants that accumulate D2-hydroxyglutarate, um, H3K4 methyl marks increase. I saw an increase in H3K36 methylation, but I didn't see an increase in H3K79, 
And this actually makes uh, a lot of sense uh, for the uh, model in which uh, demethylases are being inhibited because there are known histone demethylases that act on H3K4 and H3K36, but there's no known demethylase to act on H3K79 in, in yeast. So the next thing I wanted to ask was uh, which um, methylation mark is uh, potentially relevant to the effect that we see on silencing. Is it H3K4 or is it H3K36? And so the logic of this experiment was to delete all the known demethylase or Jumanji domain containing proteins in yeast, there's five of them, and ask whether the deletion of these genes, any particular one of these genes, um, mimics the phenotype of increasing D2-hydroxyglutarate and in inhibiting them. And so I'll just uh, cut to the, the data and tell you that when I did that, I saw uh, a, a mimic of the phenotype of increased silencing and when I deleted GIS or RPH1, and these are demethylases that act on H3K36. And the reverse experiment was to overexpress these demethylases and I see the, the opposite effect where silencing is actually um, destabilized. And so what I've shown you so far uh, is essentially a strong correlation between the accumulation of D2-hydroxyglutarate and an increase in silencing. But to really drive the point home uh, and nail down whether this effect is directly due to D2-hydroxyglutarate, I um, used a cell permeable version of the compound. And when I treated cells directly with this um, octal 2-hydroxyglutarate, I saw that in the case where the cells are unable to metabolize the compound, so in this dehydrogenase mutant, that it has the same effect when I add this. It, it stabilizes silencing further. Okay, so uh, just to summarize what I told you, I sh uh, determined that mutations capable of increasing D2-hydroxyglutarate levels in budding yeast um, increase silencing at HML. And uh, I showed you that D2-hydroxyglutarate causes histone hypermethylation at H3K36 and H3K4. And it seems that uh, the uh, relevant inhibition of methylation that's increasing silencing is related to the inhibition of demethylases that act on H3K36. And so from this, I just um, thought of uh, one potential hypothesis that I'd love to further investigate in actual tumor cells is whether D2-hydroxyglutarate levels could be uh, having the same effect in causing uh, an increase in silencing and potentially increasing uh, tumor suppressor genes. Um, and that could be one mechanism in which this uh, drives tumor progression. So with that, I'd like to thank um, members of the Rhine Lab. There's a couple of people presenting posters, so hopefully you can go check those out if you're interested. I'd like to thank uh, our collaborators, Yoon Song's group, for help with developing software to quantify uh, GFP sectors, and the Halcheck Lab at Berkeley for helping with imaging, and Tony Ivorone in the mass spec facility for helping measure D2-hydroxyglutarate in yeast. And with that, I'll take questions. I have a question. Uh, did you see any phenotype if you increase silencing? Is kind of affecting like mating type, something, mating or something? Mating. Um, no, so far we've really only looked at uh, using this crash assay. And uh, the, the amount of increase in silencing probably wouldn't have an effect on mating type. So that would okay. be expected for the opposite direction. If you lost, lost silencing, you'd see an effect. Yeah, just curious. Yeah. Hi, uh, I have one quick question. So is that possible that the 2DHJ uh, increase the activity of set one? And the set one histomethylase? Uh, it, I, would, I would propose that it's probably not increasing the activity of set one, it's potentially decreasing the activity of a demethylase that acts on H3K4. But does that affect the activity of set one? Oh, we didn't look at that. Okay, yeah. thank you. Last question. So did you look at set two mutants? Are they resistant to this compound? What we did look at so far is uh, whether the effect on these demethylases um, 
can be reversed by deleting set two. So what we saw, the decrease in, or the stability of silencing that we saw in these um, histone demethylase mutants is uh, reversed when you combine them with a set two mutation. Great. Thanks very much, Ryan. Thank you.